Hi, my name is Maria Culgan. I'm one of the product managers for Oracle Database. And in this session, I'm going to talk about how we can achieve hyperscale with Oracle Autonomous Database. Now, the Oracle Autonomous Database is one of the best platforms for developing new applications and deploying those applications. It's going to allow you to rapidly provision an Oracle Converge database. That's a database that's both multi-model as well as multi-use case. So you can store JSON relations, spatial data in that database and do things like transaction processing, analytics, machine learning, um, graph analytics on it, whatever you need to do in order to develop your application. The reason why we think it's such a great platform is that it's very easy to clone and uh, to um, create dev and test environments using that autonomous database. It also comes with a number of built-in development tools. So you get access to Oracle's low-code development environment, Apex, as part of the service, as well as access to SQL Developer Web, which is Oracle's SQL MPL SQL development environment. But what's really cool about it is, of course, the fact that it can instantly scale for you. And that's what we're going to focus on in this session. So there's two key attributes to the autonomous database that allow it to be able to be self-scaling. First is our transparent scale-out architecture that is built upon Oracle Real Application clusters on our Exadata platform and our transparent SQL parallelization so that individual SQL statements inside in the Oracle database can be um, parallelized across multiple processes so that we can improve the performance of those queries. And as the data scales, we can still perform uh, at that same acceptable performance level. So let's start with our transparent scale-out architecture. And, and as I said, we're taking advantage of real application clusters or rack databases. And what that means is your application will run on a pool of servers that are attached to shared storage. So if one of those servers should go down, the application can continue to run on the remaining rack nodes in that cluster, allowing everything to continue even though there's been a hardware failure. We also can add additional servers to that server pool and scale out that rack cluster. So as our workload increases or the volume of data increases, we can have more processing power to be able to scale that environment. And of course, it's completely transparent to the application. So the application is not aware of how many servers are in the pool or which server is running what part of the workload. All of that happens automatically for you. The application simply connects to the database using one of the predefined database services and starts running queries. Now, obviously, we could deploy that rack cluster on any hardware. But with the autonomous database, we deploy it on our Exadata infrastructure because that is the optimal hardware configuration for the Oracle database. And it also has smart database storage. Um, so we've got database software running on the storage servers in those Exadata racks that allow us to be able to offer this transparent scaling. So how does smart scan work? What does it do? SmartScan automatically offloads the data intensive processing parts of SQL statements to the storage tier, freeing up the CPU resources on the database server and minimizing the number of network round trips needed to process that query. In my example here, I'm accessing the sales table and I'm looking for information where the store ID is equal to eight. When that query comes into the database server, it's actually going to create a smart scan and send it to the storage tier. So what that smart scan will entail is information about the sales table, what database blocks make up that table, and of course, our where clause predicate, that these are the columns I'm interested in, and I'm only interested in them where the store ID equals eight. Once that smart scan arrives at the um, storage servers, they'll each go off and execute that smart scan for the piece of the sales table they contain. They'll only send back the columns I'm interested in. And once that information has been sent back to the database server, it'll um, consolidate the results and return them to the end user. So like I said, really offloading a chunk of the heavy data processing 
to the storage servers, freeing up the CPU resources on the database to do other work and minimizing the number of round trips we need to make. Now, another key advantage we get from our Exadata infrastructure is the fact that it will store the data in the, in the most optimized format for the given workload type. So it, this all happens automatically, but let's look at what happens if we were to do analytical style queries. So with analytics, we're looking at one or two attributes we have about the data in our database, but we wanna look at all of the entries we have for those attributes. And so Oracle is going to store analytical data in a columnar compressed format on Exadata in order to allow that type of access to be much more efficient and to scale. How we do that is by storing the data in a columnar compressed format. So when the query comes in, we'll only access the data we need to answer that query and uh, we'll ignore the other columns in the table. We'll also scan and filter the data in each of those columns in its compressed format um, and only decompress the entries that need to be returned to the end user. Again, greatly reducing the volume of data that needs to be read. For transaction processing, Typically in this case, we're only interested in looking at one or two records we've got stored in the database, but we'd like to look at all of the attributes or all of the column values we have for those records. So by storing that data in a row format where the column values or attributes are co-located within a single database block or in a small number of blocks, it's much more efficient for us to be able to retrieve that data via a single block IO. So as I said, automatically formatting the data based on your particular access. The other big advantage we get, of course, is the automatic creation of storage indexes. When the data is being persisted on disk, it's actually broken up into pieces or chunks, often referred to as extents. And for each one of those pieces, we're going to record the minimum and maximum value for a column and create a storage index out of these min-max ranges. That's going to allow us to do data pruning or eliminate any unnecessary I.O. when it comes to scanning and filtering that data. So if we go back and look at my original example where I was looking for information from the sales table where the store ID is eight, then we can see how this storage index will help us in that particular query. If you imagine that our sales table was made up of four pieces or four extents on disk, then we would have four min-max ranges for our store ID column. The min-max range for the first extent shows us that the minimum value is one and the maximum value is three. So we know for sure there are no store IDs with the value eight in that extent, so we can simply skip it. For the second one, we have a minimum value of four, a maximum value of seven. So again, we can also skip reading that extent. So right now we've already pruned out 50% of the table, which is great. If we move on and we look at the third extent, it has a minimum value of eight and a maximum value of 12. So we know for sure there are at least one store ID with uh, the value of eight. So we definitely have to read or scan that extent. What about the fourth and final extent in our table? Well, it has a minimum value of seven and a maximum value of 15. So it is possible there would be store IDs with a value eight in that extent. And so therefore we will go ahead and scan that. But as I said, that storage index has saved me 50% of the work because I've only had to scan 50% of the table, making it much more efficient. The final advantage we get from our Exadata infrastructure is the automatic tiering of data based on its um, access and based on how warm that data is across the different storage tiers. So the inactive or cold data is persisted on disk. The warm data is in the flash cache and the really hot or active data is stored in persistent memory or PMEM. So an Oracle automatically takes care of placing the data where it's needed based on your workload or based on your query. So as things change, we'll be able to change that data placement. And of course, Oracle can access the data at any level at any time. So some of the data for the query may be in, in persistent memory, some of it will, may be in flash and even some on disk, and we can automatically pick it up from wherever it resides. And for that really hot data, we can really access it quickly by using 
RDMA or remote data memory access. So we have a very efficient way of picking up that data from the persistent memory. So using the combination of RAC on our Exadata infrastructure, we're able to offer instant elasticity with the autonomous database. And you can scale either compute or the storage capabilities of your autonomous database independent of one another. So you're not being forced to size your system using t-shirt sizes or fixed server shapes. It is an incremental process and you can go from one to two CPUs or from two to 128 CPUs, whatever you need for your particular workload when you need it. Now, we've talked a lot about the theory. Let's take a look at a demo of this in action. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a swing bench, which is a free workload generation tool for the Oracle database. And it's going to run 128 users uh, using a JSON workload against my autonomous database. So we're here over on my OCI compute server. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off that swing bench workload. As I said, it's going to be 128 users connecting to my Oracle autonomous database. And what they're going to do is they're going to be doing inserts, inserting new JSON documents, manipulating or updating existing JSON documents, and even deleting documents. And actually that document information is passenger information about passengers uh, itineraries, whether uh, they're taking flights, um, canceling flights, as so many people are at the moment, uh, or uh, deleting older flights. And the column we're interested in looking at is the fourth column there, transactions per second. And you'll see I'm getting quite a varied rate of transactions per second because uh, my database is completely overloaded. If we look at my database, it has only two OCPUs allocated. Auto scale has been disabled. And if I look over here in the top left-hand corner, you'll see there that the system is severely CPU bound. Um, so let's go ahead and scale up my system. I'm gonna scale it from two CPUs to eight CPUs. I could enable auto scale, but I'm not going to right now. We'll look at that in just a second. Um, but right now what we'll see is that my application is gonna to continue to run while the autonomous database scales up. So that scaling is already in process. Additional Six additional OCPUs will be allocated to my database. Along with those six CPUs, I'm also getting additional memory. I'll get additional um, sessions, processes, and most importantly, for later on in the session, I'll get additional parallel server processes allocated to my database. Because I'm getting all of these additional resources, it will take a few moments for that scaling to complete, but it won't be long before my application begins to reach a steady state and actually start to behave better. So if we look at the database monitor up there on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see it's already beginning to level out. You'll see there that all of the weights I had trying to schedule people onto the CPU have um, dropped down. And if I look at my transactions per second, second there, you'll see that I'm reaching a nice steady state where I'm getting somewhere between 22 to 27,000 transactions per second because those additional CPUs are starting to kick in. Now, as I said, in order for all the memory processes and CPUs to be assigned to me, it will take a couple of more moments, but it won't be long before this status for my autonomous database changes from scaling to come available again because the scaling operation will be complete. But I can tell already that pretty much all of the additional CPU is there because my transactions per second have settled down. So let's switch back over and uh, rejoin the slides just because we've got a lot to cover. And uh, I want to make sure that we get a chance to cover it all. So we can manually scale via, via the UI as I just showed you. We could have also used the REST API, or if I had an application, I could have used the language SDKs to make that change, or we could have installed our OCI CLI command or command line interface for managing all of the assets I have in the Oracle Cloud. And in my environment there that I was using, I was using an OCI compute server to uh, run all of my demos. And I have 
in this week's blog on sequelmaria.com all the details about how you can set it up. And one of the things you can do is you can do a very quick yum install of this OCI CLI, um, which is basically a set of uh, Python or Python application that you can download. You configure it to point at your particular environment. So in my case, my autonomous database, and then you can run very si simple scripts to be able to do this scaling. Um, or to do any of the other database lifecycle management, starting, stopping, backing up of the database, whatever you need to do, whatever can be done through the UI can also be done through the command line. Now, you may be thinking that's great, but I don't actually know when my workload will peak or when I'll need these additional uh, CPUs or resources. So what do I do then? Well, if you don't know when your database is gonna need those additional resources, um, then what you can take advantage of is something called auto scale. What auto scale does is it allows you to specify a base number of OCPUs. And as your workload increases, Oracle will automatically scale up your system up to three times that base CPU count in order to accommodate that additional work. So you'll instantly get additional CPU resources, additional IO, as part of auto scale. Now, what you won't get is additional memory or additional sessions or parallel server processes. So just bear that in mind. But if you need that instant boost, you can get it because there's no lag or delay with auto scale as there was briefly there when I showed you manual scaling in action. So in order to really understand how this works, I wanted to show you a comparison of two autonomous data warehouses each with four OCPUs allocated, but with and without auto scale. So the database on the left-hand side there, as I said, it has four OCPUs allocated to it, but it does not have auto scale enabled. Therefore, the maximum number of CPUs it can use is four. The database on the right-hand side also has four OCPUs allocated to it, but it does have auto scale enabled, which means the maximum number of processes or, or OCPUs it can use is actually 12, three times that base OCPU count. Now let's start the same workload on both systems. I'm going to connect eight sessions and run eight concurrent queries. So you see that in the lower left-hand side of each panel that I'm running eight queries. And by the way, the panels that I'm showing you here, these are available to you as part of the console, these screens, as part of um, the OCI console for the autonomous database. So I have eight concurrent sessions eight concurrent queries running. And if I look at the database activity, I see all eight sessions are on CPU. Now you may be wondering, hang on a second, I thought I only had four CPUs. How did you get all eight sessions active? Well, remember each OCPU has two threads, four OCPUs, two threads means I can have eight concurrent queries running. So really no difference between the two environments except for the CPU utilization. For the autonomous data warehouse on the left, where I don't have auto scale enabled, I'm 100% CPU utilization because all four OCPUs are active. If I look on the autonomous data warehouse where auto scale is enabled, what I find is that I'm actually only 33% CPU utilization. Why? Because that database has the ability to have all 12 OCPUs active, and so I'm only using four of them or a third of those CPUs. So let's bump up the workload. Instead of having, having eight concurrent sessions, let's go to 24. 24 concurrent sessions, 24 concurrent queries. Now, they again, both have the same workload, but if I look at the database activity, I see quite a difference here. On the autonomous data warehouse on the left, where I don't have auto scale, I still have eight sessions happily on CPU, happily running their query, but I have 16 sessions that have to wait for to be scheduled on that CPU because we've run out of resources. Whereas on the autonomous data warehouse on the right, where I do have auto scale, the system has detected the additional workload and has instantly given me that extra CPU that I need to accommodate those 24 concurrent queries. And now if I look at the CPU utilization 
on both sides. I see I'm 100% utilized on both servers because the auto scale has kicked in and all 12 OCPUs are active on autonomous data warehouse on the right. So how does this work? What do I actually pay for and what do I get? Well, you only pay for those additional CPUs when you need them. So the rest of the time you'd be paying the same base rate of just four CPUs. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's great. We now understand how the Oracle Autonomous Database can take advantage of Rack and Exadata to do that transparent scale out. But let's turn our attention now to what happens inside the database when queries come in and I'm looking to scale the, those queries um, and improve the performance by taking advantage of parallel execution inside in the Oracle Autonomous Database. So when I connect to an Oracle database, a background process is created for me. That's my session process. And normally when I'm running serial queries, it's that process that's actually going to do the work for me. But if I issue a parallel statement or a statement that's going to use parallel execution, that process changes its role and becomes the query coordinator who then actually acquires parallel server processes from a shared pool of resources on the database. And it's those parallel server processes that will actually do the work for me. And the coordinator is going to coordinate with those uh, or communicate with those processes. And those processes can communicate with each other using in-memory buffers. That's how they're actually all going to communicate. Once the parallel server processes have done the work, they'll send the results to the coordinator who will aggregate them up and return them to the end user. So how does this parallelism work in the autonomous database? Well, it's controlled by depending on the database service you use to connect to your autonomous database. Now, the autonomous database comes with five predefined services, two specifically for transaction processing, the other three for analytics, reporting, or batch processing. So let's look at the two that are for transaction processing. They're called TP Urgent and TP for transaction processing. And given the fact that they are for kind of end user applications, one where uh, we're looking for very uh, quick uh, response time for queries, they don't run in parallel. They run serial because they're accessing, remember, just a small number of records inside in the database. But for the analytical queries and for the reporting work, then we want to use parallelism, in which case we'll connect to the three other autonomous database services, which are high, medium, and low. Just as their names imply, that tells you the priority that those different sessions have, and it also tells you or indicates the parallelism that's going to be used. Queries that connect to the high service will get the highest degree of parallelism possible based off of the number of OCPUs allocated to that database. Sessions connected to medium will get a parallel degree of four and sessions connected to low will run serial. So one of the other great advantages we have with the autonomous database is the fact that it has a built-in demo schema. You can actually take advantage of um, a one terabyte size uh, star schema benchmark that's available to you. So that demo environment is built in. It's not part of your space allocation. And I'm going to show you now uh, with a quick demo just what we can do with parallelism. So as you can see, my workload has finished and our um, autonomous transaction processing database is available again with a count of eight CPUs. So let's now take a look at running some queries serially and in parallel on our system. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to uh, the TP service. And let me just go ahead and log in here. And what I'm going to ask it to do is, first of all, show me what you would do if I issue this query, and then we'll run it so that you can see what's going on. So it's a very simple query against the main fact table of that demo schema. As I said, that schema is available for us to query, and it doesn't uh, take up any space in our allocation of space inside the autonomous database, but it is about a terabyte worth of raw data. 
So I'm looking to find the most expensive order we had where the ship mode was air. And because I don't have any indexes on this schema, it is going to do a full table scan of the line orders table. And it's going to be a smart scan. I know that because the keyword storage appears there in the execution plan. So we know for sure that we will be offloading this query. So let's go ahead and execute it. Now, if I switch over and quickly log in again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that while this query is running, there is only one active session. So there is only one process running this query. So uh, I know for sure, oh, and it's done. Uh, I know for sure it was just one process and it took just around 13 seconds to do it. So if we pop over here and we do exactly the same thing connected to the medium service, what we should see is that the plan will look a little different and it does it's still a full table scan of the line orders table but you'll see there are additional steps appearing in the execution plan and what these additional steps are is they indicate parallel execution is taking place that's what the px at the beginning of each line means and it's the communication between the processes and of course the coordinator and i also see underneath the plan that this is going to be executed in parallel as well. So let's go ahead and execute that now. And what we'll find is a lot more resources. If you look at my database monitor are being used and it's back much faster. It took just four seconds to do that. Now it's not just full table scans that will see this benefit with parallel execution. I can do a much more complicated query one where I'm going to do joins and aggregations of my workload. So what I'm doing here is actually a five table join. I'm using all of the tables in this demo star schema, um, joining all of the dimensions to that larger fact table. And I just have one filter predicate on the region. And if you look in the execution plan, although it looks much more complicated than our previous plan did, it's still a serial plan. Why? Because we've got no entries in that plan with the PX at the beginning of the line to indicate parallel execution. And the reason the plan looks as complicated as it does is that we've got something called a vector transformation occurring. Now this happens automatically. It is an optimization by the Oracle database. But before I begin talking about what that is, I wanted to kick off the query for you um, because I know it's going to take a long time to run and we are always tight on time in these sessions. Now, if we look at the database monitor, we'll see that we are busy. You'll see that there, um, there is some resources being used, but again, it's still just a single process that's doing it. Where if I come over to the medium service now and I do exactly the same thing, um, when we see the execution plan, it's going to be a lot longer. It's still the same plan, um, but it just looks longer because it's got all these additional steps that demonstrate that parallel execution is going to take place. Now, let me go ahead and execute this. So I now have two different sessions going, one where we've got um, serial execution, and now this one where we've got parallel execution going on. And if we look over on the DB monitor, we'll actually be able to see a lot more resources are going to start to be used um, because these parallel server processes are going to be executing the query. Uh, if I go back over here to where I've got just the single process, it's still running. It's going to take it a while. Um, but let me explain what's happening in the plan. So in the plan, as I said, we've got um, vector transformation taking place. And what that's actually going to do is it's going to allow Oracle to do the join and the aggregation steps of our query as part of the full table scan of line orders or the fact table. And we're able to do that by um, breaking up the execution of the query into two parts or to two steps, very similar to what we would have done with the star schema transformation, if you're familiar with that. And in the first step, we're going to scan all of the dimension tables, apply any where clause predicates we have on those. And then we're going to create these key vectors. And those key vectors have all the information we need to complete the join and the aggregation as part of the scan of the line orders table. And you see those key vectors being used down here as we do that full table scan. And of course, because we can do this type of transformation using smart scan, 
we can actually offload that processing to Exadata. And in fact, the query looks like it has completed at least the parallel one. Yep, if I flip over to the parallel screen, it actually completed while I was talking. How did I know? Well, in the corner of my eye, I saw the database monitor there and I saw the resources drop. So 53 seconds for the medium service, which has parallelism. Unfortunately, our single process is still out there running it. I'll let you in on a little secret. It's gonna take that three or four minutes to complete. So while it's doing that, I wanted to show you a little trick. Now this isn't documented, um, but it, it, I found it to be incredibly handy. If you find that you're connected to your autonomous database, um, and in my case here, I'm gonna be connected to the TP service. I just did a quick query to confirm that and I want parallelism, what can I do? Well, traditionally, you'd say if you wanted a query to run in parallel, you would supply a parallel hint to that SQL statement. So here's the exact same SQL statement we ran initially, and I've added a parallel hint to it. Um, but if I look at my execution plan, I didn't get any entries or lines in that execution plan with PX at the beginning of them, so it's not a parallel plan. So how do I get around that? Um, I can also tell, by the way, that my hint wasn't used. Uh, it tells me underneath, by the way, your hint wasn't used. And the reason it wasn't used was parallel execution is not allowed on the service I'm connected to. Now, obviously, I could simply disconnect and reconnect to the database. But I'm going to show you a little trick that I can switch my consumer group or my service um, on the fly. And I'm able to do that by taking advantage of some of the, one of the functions inside in the DBMS session package. This is a supplied PL SQL package in the Oracle database. I'm going to switch my current consumer group and I'm going to tell it to put me in the high group as if I had connected on the high service. So now when I ask it, what consumer group am I, am I in? It says, okay, you're connected to high. So let's check the plan now for my SQL statement. So same SQL statement, again, par same parallel hint. And all of a sudden, my C plan has PX entries in it because now I'm connected to high and therefore I'm going to get parallel execution. And if I go ahead and run that, we should expect to see it finish closer to the four or five seconds in there. There it is, five seconds to what we originally saw. Now, I know I need to be conscious of time uh, because we always have a limited time together. So let me go ahead and um, switch us back over to the slides, to the presentation uh, before we run out of time. So as I said, you can use this demo schema to try out all sorts of stuff. Obviously, it's very easy for me to show you parallel execution against it, but you can look at vector transformations and all the other different um, techniques we have in Oracle utilizing that schema. You can also do like a create table as select to create your own versions of that schema. Now that will take up space in your allocation, but then you can manipulate the data um, as well if you want to just do more benchmarks or try things out on the system. So how do you get access to your own autonomous database? Well, of course you can take advantage of our always free tier where you'll get access to two autonomous databases um, where you can try out everything we've seen here today. The only um, caveat or limit on those is the capacity, how much data you can put in them. So there is a limit of 20 gigs, but otherwise you can do exactly what I did. You could have done the side-by-side -side comparison for with and without auto scale on those two autonomous databases. You can set up a um, compute instance, just like I did. As I said, all the steps to do that are available in my blog this week. You can install and run Swingbench just as I did. Remember, that's a free tool available to you from uh, Dominic Giles. So very, very easy to begin the development of your own apps and your own prototypes by taking advantage of everything I've shown you. And of course, the built-in development tools, Application Express or Apex, as well as SQL Developer Web. So with that, I think it's time for us to jump over and do uh, some Q&A. So let me just stop sharing for a second so that I can see the chat. Oh, we do, we do have some questions. Okay, so first question, can I change the scale factor from 3X to something else? 
oh, okay, so with auto scale, you can't change the um, scale factor from 3x. That is the default. What you can do, though, is you can change the base number of CPUs, which will obviously um, control how much you're going to be able to scale. Um, and remember, we don't always go from base to 3x. We will actually adjust the number of CPUs and what you pay for based on your workload. So if your workload only needs 1.5 times the base or 2x of the base, then that's what you'll get. And as soon as you no longer need them, you'll instantly scale back down to that base number of CPUs. Okay, next question. Can I bring my own licenses, including standard edition, to the autonomous database uh, to make it cheaper? Okay, so yes, you can do BYOL as we call it, or bring your own license with the Oracle Autonomous Database. And what that allows you to do is instead of paying for license included, which covers your database software and all of the infrastructure, and I think it's about a thousand dollars a month per OCPU, you just pay for the infrastructure. So when you bring your own license, including standard edition, um, you can uh, reduce that cost, as I said, from around a thousand bucks a month to around $200 a month or $240 a month. And so it makes it much more economical, especially if you've got standard edition licenses on prem today to utilize those as you migrate to the cloud as part of BYOL. Now, our third question is, when I connect to the autonomous database via the predefined services, is my connection encrypted? Okay, so yes, all network traffic in and out, in and out of the autonomous database is encrypted. And so when you provision your autonomous database, you are given a security wallet or a, a wallet that holds your encryption keys. And you need to download that to whichever um, application server you're using, whether it's your own laptop, um, or in my case, the copy of that wallet is over on my compute instance in the Oracle Cloud. And I actually was using that wallet as part of my connection stream, both in um, the command line interface, the SQL CL that we used for parallel execution, and also when I did Swingbench. So you would have seen a .zip file listed in um, my connection string on Swingbench, and that's what that was. That was my wallet to establish that encrypted connection. It uses TLS, uh, so standard network encryption, to establish that. You can also um, make sure that your autonomous database is accessed through your own private cloud network. So if that's the way you've done it, um, then it's optional to use the wallet. Uh, but honestly, there is no reason not to use the encrypted wallet. It is probably the most secure way for you to be able to connect uh, to your autonomous database. Now, just before uh, we wrap up, I just want to share some details on the next section that's coming up. Uh, any other questions you may have, you can just put them in chat because folks are still available to answer those. But let's just take a quick look at what's coming up next, which is, of course, our panel debate. And the topic today is, should your data be relational? And this conversation is going to be led by Neil Mendelssohn, one of the great PMs for the Oracle database. And joining him are three of my favorite folks. Um, they're uh, Heli, Stuart, and Lucas. They come from our uh, Oracle ACE Directors program, great experts in the field of database data management. Uh, so that should be a very exciting conversation. So definitely stay tuned for that. You can also find more details on the rest of the agenda for today by going to developer.oracle.com slash developer live slash database um, and join any of the other sessions later on today. But with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event today. Thanks.